Hi, this is Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to share simple, easy to understand strategies, insights and tips to help you master the game of building wealth. And in this episode, I'd like to talk about how Australia's property market is significantly different to other countries and in fact that The Economist magazine writes a story every few years talking about how over or undervalued Australian property is and it's really like comparing apples with oranges you know I think our market is significantly different and I'd like to talk through that and then um, I think once you sort of understand that difference and the challenges the geographical and infrastructure challenges that we face that frankly are very difficult to solve Um, how that creates a significant investment opportunity uh, for people that want to play the long game. So I'm talking what will happen with property over the very long run, the next uh, two, three or four decades, rather than what's going to happen over the next couple of months. So I was travelling in uh, around France a a few weeks ago, uh, lucky enough to sort of drive around the south of France, which was uh, very lovely. Um, But Notice that France is very easy to get around. The the roads are in incredibly good condition. Uh, there's a lot of there's a few you know highways that are toll roads. You have to pay not a lot of money, but a little bit of money. Um, but the roads are in incredibly good condition, and, and the train network uh, works fantastically well. Trains are fast, efficient. They're always on time, uh, and so forth. And you know when you sit back and compare France with Australia, you realise that you know Fr- France would fit. 14 times into Australia, you know, in terms of uh, land area. You know, it's significantly a smaller amount of land, but there's three times more people. You know, there's 76 million, odd million people in France and only about sort of 25 million in in Australia. And then you realise that, um, you you realise that density um, makes a big difference. So there's, you know, 122 people per square kilometre of land in France, where there's only three people per square kilometre in Australia and about 33 people per square kilometre in, in the US. So it shows that we just don't have enough taxpayers to really cover the the significant amount of land uh, that we have. And, um, and therefore, capital cities really do provide a massive draw card in terms of education facilities, schools and universities, the more diverse employment opportunities, health facilities and amenities and lifestyle benefits. And I guess that's why 60% of uh, the Australian population either lives in Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane or Perth, you know, the four main capital cities. And if you think about it, I haven't looked at the sort of land size, but 60% of uh, of the Australian population is probably living in about five percent of its land mass, um, so that creates some 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 problems and and uh, and uh, I guess investment opportunities as well. Where you compare that with France, only three percent of the population actually lives in Paris. You know, so it's living in Lyon or, or Toulouse, you know, some of the larger cities in in France isn't such a big disadvantage. I mean, it still has it's still well serviced. Uh, with lots of different amenities and education facilities and employment opportunities and so forth, it's more spread out and more dense. So it takes the pressure off Paris. It takes the pressure off the capital cities to deliver um, a lot of those amenities. And look, certainly in Australia, the the federal and local state governments have been working hard to really promote regional uh, centres like uh, Newcastle and Wollongong in New South Wales and Geelong and Bendigo in Victoria, but they really just haven't worked. You know, they haven't really taken any significant pressure off. So um, really to solve the housing affordability challenge in Australia, we really do need a massive infrastructure spend. You know, we, we need better public transport, faster trains, better roads. Um, essentially what we need to do is make it uh, less painful to live 30 to 100 k's away from a CBD. Um, for example, in, in France, the trains travel at up to 300 kilometres per hour. So a train from Melbourne to Geelong, for example, should take 16 minutes if it's travelling that fast. You know, if it only took 16 minutes, a lot more people would live in Geelong or that surrounding area, take a lot of pressure off Melbourne and also Melbourne's uh, property prices. But Australia just doesn't have enough taxpayers uh, to fund this very, very costly infrastructure. And potentially you could look to the Future Fund, which was set up um, about 11 or 12 years ago, 
uh, to really fund uh, the government's unfunded superannuation liabilities, but it now has uh, its target was to have 140 billion by 2020. It's currently got about 150 billion dollars, so there's already some surplus monies. And arguably, uh, the government, what they should be doing is taking some of those surplus monies because they, they aren't going, they said they're not going to access the future fund for at least another six to seven years. I think they may be taking those surplus monies and really investing it for the next two, three or four, five, six decades to come. Uh, because given the population growth, we're going to have some challenges. In any case, I don't think any government's going to think that longer term and do that sort of longer term planning. And it would be a very costly and challenging process. So I don't think it's going to change any anytime soon. And so that it, that creates a big challenge, I guess, an infrastructure challenge and a and a and a, and a challenge to deal with, you know, higher population. It just means that living close to the city in the CBD, you know, in the CBD, close to the CBD, um, will become more and more attractive. Traffic congestion is already a problem and it's going to become a, a bigger and bigger problem as each year goes by. So living in a, a 30 or 40 k's out from the CBD means that it takes you a lot longer to get anywhere, particularly if you have to drive across the other side of the, the city. Uh, so there's advantages in living, say, 8 k's from the CBD because you've not only got a lot more transport options, uh, but you've got a lot less traffic to navigate or at least distance of traffic to navigate. Um, and that advantage will become more and more pronounced as our population grows and as there's more and more demand and pressure on the capital cities because living, you know, 100 k's away from a capital city in Australia just doesn't cut it for a lot of people. Now, of course, the city doesn't uh, suit everyone and I get that um, people. some people will enjoy living in a regional town or even in the country somewhere uh, but I'm just really talking about the vast majority of people, a uh, vast majority of the Australian population. It's already a, a problem. And last week, one of our team members that only lives 11 k's away outside of the, the Melbourne CBD uh, took an hour to get to work. You know, our public transport system is a joke. Our roads are, are clogged and congested. Um, and and that's what it is today. You can imagine in 10 years' time, that's going to become even more stark. And that just means... Uh, that uh, inner city, good quality blue chip inner city locations become more and more in demand. The interesting thing also is that I have a chart courtesy of Pete Wargent, uh, who writes an excellent blog, um, and the link is in the show notes, uh, of the difference between the population growth and, and uh, new dwelling starts. So how many houses we're building in Victoria, and you can see that there's a a, a, an increasing gap between the number of houses we're building and the population growth in Melbourne. So all it's suggesting is that we're moving closer and closer to a, a housing supply shortage. And also in Melbourne, you know, we're forecast to reach maybe 5 million people by 2021. We're currently at 4.44 million and 8 million by 2050. That's a significant increase in population. Uh, well, now, all those people aren't going to be able to live in the inner city blue chip ring suburbs, but significant proportion of them will want to, and only a lesser, smaller proportion will be able to afford to. But the point is that if there's an imbalance in supply and demand at the moment, and if we're assuming or looking at the charts that show this, that supply is actually retracting, and certainly supply of um, high-rise uh, development in terms of approvals, they've fallen, they've almost halved. Uh, over the last uh, 12 to 18 months. So really what we're moving into is a, a scene where we've got housing supply is falling away, we've got population growth that's very strong, and we've got a geographical problem that can't be solved um, unless you spend literally billions or trillions of dollars on infrastructure, probably something um, a country with only 25 million people or I think about 15 million taxpayers uh, a country that cannot afford with only 15 million taxpayers. And, and so if you take the very long view, you know, if you sort of stand back and go, okay, how's that going to play out over the next couple of decades? It just means that inner city property is always going to outperform and or at least that demand for inner city property is going to be far less susceptible to the ebbs and flows of um, uh, confidence and, and these sorts of things. I mean, if you're going to bet on any 
part of the market, it'd have to be that inner city market. And so there's really only two points I'd like to reiterate. The first one is that our unique situation, geographical situation, puts a huge amount of pressure on our capital cities significantly different to many, many other places around the world. In fact, I think Australia is very unique because of the few taxpayers it has, therefore it can't spend on infrastructure as much on infrastructure, just has a lot lower density. And so um, everyone's flocking to just a very small um, uh, geographical location. Perhaps uh, the only comparable country is perhaps Russia, for example, uh, and so this uniqueness makes it easy then to spot the, the pockets that are going to really uh, enjoy the most excessive demand. And then secondly, I can't predict what property will do in the short term, but in the longer term, the, the longer term indicators uh, certainly demonstrate that uh, in the long run, investors that take that long term will be very well rewarded for their patience. And I see it every day. I met a client just recently that's been a client for 15 years Invest in a whole bunch of property 15 years ago and um, it's made a significant amount of wealth, generated a significant amount of wealth uh, for this client. It's really about investing in good quality assets and then having the patience, maybe waiting 20 years. And you might have to wait for that full 20 years to enjoy all the returns, um, but you know, having that patience to do that. Uh, of course, asset selection uh, is a very important aspect as well. So... It looks like the market's uh, showing some sort of green shoots of recovery. Certainly the, um, the auction clearance rate has um, uh, picked up, uh, but that's partly because of the supply shortage. There's just not a lot of property on the market at the moment. Um, but hopefully as lending loosens up, and I hope that does uh, loosen up over the next six months, um, and we regain a little bit of confidence, we'll see uh, certainly more buyers and what we really need is more vendors in the market selling property. But potentially, uh, there's, uh, whilst I wouldn't call it recovery, uh, there are indications that perhaps the, the market has um, already bottomed out and so now might be a perfect opportunity to get in, particularly if you're going to take that longer term view. Anyway, that's it for this week. Uh, until next week, uh, I'll speak to you then. Bye for now.